What's good? It's your man Ribsy and welcome to my dark room, aka my kitchen, my bathroom, you name it. As you already know, I don't have the fortune of having an amazing kind of self-contained dark room, but I still make it happen. So I'm gonna show you exactly how I make prints at home with some key tools and not too much hassle. This four part series is sponsored by Tetanol. Tetanol is a manufacturer of chemicals used for darkroom by professional labs, but also by home enthusiasts just like me. Their product line includes developing chemistry for black and white and color, darkroom chemistry, and even paper. Not to mention, Tenno also sells and distributes products from all of your favorite analog photography companies such as Kodak, Fuji, Ilford, and more. Use my affiliate link down below in order to shop for the darkroom chemistry you need to get started, but also for any other film photography things you might be interested in. All right, welcome to my kitchen. So I think one key thing we need to talk about right now is the fact that for color printing, you actually have the luxury of doing it in an open light space, such as a kitchen. Of course, your enlargement has to happen completely in the dark. But once you do that and you put your paper in the processing drum, you can exit that dark space and then go to somewhere much more open and airy and comfortable, such as your kitchen. So in my home, I do my enlargement in the bathroom, which we're gonna go to in just a second, but then everything else happens here in the kitchen in a wide open space. I've got great ventilation, great light, a lot of space, and it's very comfortable. And it's all because I have this, which is the processing drum, which means you know I can do my developing like this completely in the light and it's you know very easy to do so i encourage you to think about having your space potentially that way as well you don't need just a contained dark room for color printing it might be very comfortable it might be very cool to do that but if you don't have it you can still do a lot without having that dedicated space so step one of this entire process is to actually get your chemicals nice and warm as i mentioned in the previous video i don't control my temperature very explicitly i don't use a thermometer i don't use a sous vide i don't use any of that stuff and that's because if i'm making one-off prints it's not really that necessary. I can just get my chemicals nice and hot and then go from there. So that's what we're gonna do. I've got my working solutions here. I've got my developer and I've got my Blix as well. I'm gonna put both of these in the bucket. And then now I'm gonna fill up that bucket with very hot water and that's gonna keep my temperature for the rest of this printing session. All right, so you've heated up your chemicals and now I'm actually gonna show you the steps that it takes to make a print. We're not gonna make a print right now because we're gonna hop into the dark room in just a little bit to actually expose some paper. But for now, I'm gonna show you the steps that you're gonna to have to do basically every time for every single round of developing. So it all starts with your developer. Once your paper's in here, you're ready to then pour in your developer. And we're gonna do that right now. So you pour in your developer like so, and you wanna do it very carefully to ensure that the water only goes down the main entrance there. The, the developer is now stuck in the chamber in this top part, you wanna seal it. And then once you tilt it like this, all of the developer leaks out from the chamber and actually starts to contact your paper. So at that point, you wanna make sure to start agitating. And this is what you would do for 45 seconds. If you have the rollers that I showed you earlier, then you can just you know, put it on the table and roll it very easily. But I don't like using the rollers, I like doing it by hand. So this is what I do. So let's assume your 45 seconds are done. You wanna pour your developer back into the measuring cup or into another vessel, basically somewhere to discard it. Um, you, know, you can kind of accumulate it and then at the end of your session, then go ahead and waste, uh, dispose of the waste however you feel is necessary. The second round now is the Blix. So your developer's there, now it's Blix time. For the Blix, I usually pour in a lot. I don't measure this part because it doesn't really matter how much you pour in as long as you put enough. So I usually put in a bunch. Same thing here. Once you tilt, you're ready to go. You tilted, the, the Blix is now contacting the surface area of your paper and you want to agitate for 45 seconds. 45 seconds are up, take the cover off, pour your Blix back into your measuring cup and this you can reuse. Remember, this you can start to use over and over and over again until you notice that it has been exhausted and you can notice that visually. So we're done there with the Blix. And then now it's time to rinse your print. There's no print in here, obviously, as I mentioned, this is a demo, but what you would just do is open up your container and then turn on the faucet and fill it up. And I like to rotate it as I fill it up so that the water gets everywhere. And then I do a bit of agitation like this. Turn off your water and then pour it out. And I do that, you know, maybe two or three times because when you do it that way, then you can assure that your paper is thoroughly rinsed. So at that point, now you're ready to take the paper out of the uh, container here. You take it out and you've got your paper. I'll show you what to do with that once we actually make a print. But what I just showed you is the process that's gonna happen for every single round of developing, whether you're making test strips or whether you're making a final print. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the dark room now and show you how to actually start to make a print. So we're in the dark room now and it's time to make a print. First thing you wanna do in order to actually save paper and get most efficient use out of what you have is to cut test strips. So as you can see here, 
I've got, you know, test prints that were made on what looked to be torn pieces of paper. And that's exactly what it is. In the dark, I would take out a sheet of paper and then I would basically rip it into thirds. And doing so would give me sections this big. I then would use these sections to actually expose the test print. Um, that's good because if you use a whole sheet of paper to do test prints, you're going to burn through paper. If you use segments, you can be a bit more nimble and make a lot more changes and save paper. So you have to do this completely in the dark. I know it's kind of annoying. You can also use a scissor if you want, but of course, you know, that could be a little dangerous in the dark if you're not very careful. So scissor or tearing, it doesn't matter, but make sure you tear some test prints and then put them in your box along with the other unexposed paper. Um, and then you can make your test prints that way. Okay, so test strips are out of the way. Now it's time to actually size your print. So what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, we're gonna turn off the lights, we're gonna turn on the enlarger, and then you're actually gonna move the enlarger up or down and focus it to get the image the size that you want it to be as part of your easel. So to do that, you wanna use a test sheet of paper, which is what I have right here. This is an old print. You might recognize that guy from one of my videos. Um, but ultimately, I flip it over. I've got a white piece of paper now, and we're gonna put this on our easel, just like so. It's on the easel, and now you have a white surface that in the darkness will reflect the exposure from this perfectly. So you'll be able to see what you're doing. Um, so let's go ahead and turn off the light, and then we can actually play with the enlarger. We can move the easel, and we're basically just going to get the image of where we want it to be. So I've turned off the lights, and we've got our enlarger now making an actual image from the negative onto the easel. That's how you can see it's colored right here. So what we want to do is basically first evaluate the position of your easel. You can literally move your easel around, you know. The image itself will stay where it is, but your easel, you can move. So let's say we want the easel there, and then let's say we want the image to not be fully zoomed out. We want to get all the borders and everything. I'm going to actually lower my enlarger by pushing it down, and now you can see that the image is now fitting within the full space of the sheet. So then I can fix the focus just to get a rough focus, and you know, there it's in focus. Of course that's too small, so then I can move my enlarger up again and adjust the focus. So what you want to do is just do this process kind of over and over again until you get it where exactly you want it to be. You don't have to worry about having critical focus yet, that's a next step, but here you want to get your composition down and get it focused as close as you can with your eye, just to ensure that the positioning is correct. So if we actually want to zoom into this, we can pull our enlarger up. See, pull it up and now the image looks much bigger and it's out of focus. So now I will find the focus again and it's actually this way. As you can see, now it fills the entire size of the image space from the easel. So that works too. There's no right answer here. This is up to what you want to do based on what you're trying to create. So this is how you do it. You move your enlarger up and down, and then you find the focus with the focus knob here as well. All right, so you've composed your image based on the last step, and now it's time to actually find the focus of your image. You already got somewhere close to being in focus, but you want to fine tune it now to ensure you have very sharp prints so there's two ways to do it. One, you can do it with just your eyes. And you know, that's kind of the harder way, but again, it's the way that you can do it without having to buy more equipment. If you can afford a focus finder, then get one. And to use a focus finder, all you do is open it up by going like that. You put it on top of the center of your image, because now the projection is going to be coming down to the little mirror that's there. And then now you can actually look. So you put your eye to the focus finder, and then with the focus knob on the enlarger, you turn it and you turn it up until you can see the grain on the actual projection. So there's the grain. Once you find it and you like where it is, you can then lock your enlarger to make sure it doesn't move. Um, at this point, you know, you'll have your focus. Fo finding focus depends on what film you have because films of higher ISO, such as an EC400 or anything even higher than that, um, you're gonna have very apparent grain. So it's gonna be very easy to find the grain with your eye or with the focus finder. Film like Portra 160, for example, or some black and white films that are ISO 100, they're going to have very, very fine grain. So you might actually not be able to see the grain with the naked eye. And therefore, you really have to focus, you know, pun intended. But you really have to pay attention and ensure that, you know, you're focusing it exactly where you want it to be. But once you do that, then you're all set. It's time to go ahead and make some test prints. So everything's all set now. We've got our composition and we've got our focus. Now it's time to make a test print. Um, this goes without saying, but you can see me right now because I've got some light allowing into this room. But these steps that we do now have to be in pitch blackness because you're going to be using your unexposed paper. So if it's exposed to any light, you're going to get light leaks or you're going to ruin the paper altogether. So just know that the next steps are happening in pitch blackness, even though I'm going to demo them for you with some light. So it's time to make a test print. What we're going to do here is we're going to turn on the enlarger. It's going to expose on the sheet, but using something to obstruct the light, 
we're gonna actually do intervals of exposure. So our first one's gonna be three seconds, our second one's gonna be six seconds, and our last one's gonna be nine seconds. And to do that, you turn on the enlarger, let it fully expose the paper, and then do that for three seconds. Enlarger stops, then you cover a third of your page, turn on the enlarger again, and now the other two thirds of the page are gonna be exposed again for three seconds, and then you stop. Then you cover, and just only leave one third of the last page remaining, and that's gonna actually give you that final nine second exposure. So let me actually turn on the enlarger right now, and then we can do that. So ready? So our enlarger is on right now, one, two, three, it's gonna turn off, and there you go, it's turned off. So remember, in the dark, all of this is happening. Now in the dark, you cover a third of your sheet, and you turn the enlarger on one more time. Enlarger's on, paper's being exposed again, so that's, Another three seconds, and now we're gonna do the final three seconds on the remaining third of this. So let's turn the enlarger on one more time. Enlarger's on, and paper's being exposed. Voila, so now you have a sheet of paper that has three intervals on it. Three seconds, six seconds, and nine seconds. So now let's go ahead and develop that, and we can see what it looks like. So here's our text exposure that we did just a few moments ago, and we've got our three intervals. We've got our three second one, which is the lightest, our six second, and then our nine second, which is the darkest one. So based off of this, we can tell that around six seconds is gonna be you know, kind of the ballpark of where we wanna be. We can adjust this again later, because once we change the colors, we'll probably have to adjust the exposure just a little bit, but six seconds gets us kind of close to where we wanna be. The other thing we can tell based off of this test print is that the color is completely wrong. Uh, this is looking extremely blue. So what does that mean? That means you want to eliminate blue. And how do you eliminate blue? You add yellow. So in our larger settings, we're going to filter less yellow and potentially less magenta as well. We're going to turn it so that it's allowing a lot more of those colors to come through. So what we're going to do now is make another test print and it's going to have the base setting of about six, as I mentioned here. But then we're also going to find a centralized color and then do some colors that are more blue, more green, and then we'll do some that are more magenta, more yellow. And then you can get the full spread and evaluate which one you think you like the most. So let's go. Okay, so we figured out our exposure time and we know kind of the rough settings we wanna go with based on what we saw in the previous one. So what you wanna do now is make multiple exposures on different pieces of paper with different color settings. How do you do that? Well, one at a time. So you, know, you get your strip, you put it on here on the enlarger easel, you expose it, and then you put this in your paper tank. Then you turn on the lights, you change the settings on your enlarger to accommodate the next kind of chunk you wanna do, turn off the lights, and then grab a different piece of paper, put it on here, expose it, and then put that back into your paper container. So now there's two papers, two pieces of paper in the processing drum. Well, you got more space in there, so you wanna make another test print with different enlarger settings. The point here is that you wanna keep doing that in order to get various different color settings because at the end, then you can look at all of them at once and decide which one looks the best based on what you're trying to accomplish with the print. It's a little bit challenging, of course, because you have to switch on between light and dark, but the point is, you know, you expose your paper, put it in the light safe drum, and then change the settings, and then you can do the whole process again. I find that this is the fastest way to achieve various different looks of color, then you can then evaluate and determine which one you like the best. So let's actually go ahead and finalize one of these and then we'll look at all six of the different print options that I made and then we can pick one for our final print. Okay, so we've made all of our color prints here. And as I mentioned, you know, we did different settings for each different test print. It was a lot of work, but it was worth it because now we have kind of what I would like to call a color map. Um, so basically, starting at the top left and ending down here, we've increased the filtration of uh, magenta and yellow as we go forward. Here we've got 00, zero cyan, 35 magenta, 35 yellow. And here we end with 00, zero cyan, 65 magenta, and 65 yellow. Um, so now, you look at this in daylight. Of course, my, day my light here is daylight balanced, so this is fairly accurate. But you could also just go to a room that's got windows and has some daylight. And with that, you can then evaluate what you wanna do with these prints. Which one do you like the most? So looking at this, I have a feeling I kinda of like somewhere in between these two right here. Um, this one's got that really beautiful kind of purple stuff happening around the highlights. Um, and this one is just a bit tamer than that one. So 
I think what we're probably gonna do is make a final print that is somewhere in the realm of these two. So let's go ahead and pick the settings for this, which are 00, 45, 45, and we can make our final print. Okay, so you saw that we finalized our color option and we really liked one of the options that we saw. So we're putting these settings in the enlarger here and then we're gonna turn off all the lights and then it's time to make a print. And this is gonna be our final print. So you wanna be very careful. You wanna make sure not to get any fingerprints on it. You wanna make sure to blow off any air. And then you just wanna expose it and develop it nicely just to ensure that everything comes out exactly as you want it. So let's go ahead and make a print now. So I'm excited, it's time to finally pull out our final print. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this and we should have a nice exposed piece of paper here. And we do. So check that out. That's our final print. And you know, I noticed a couple things already. I like the colors, I like how it looks. It's got the right mood, exposure, all of the above. But there's some imperfections here. We'll talk about that in the next video where we can troubleshoot prints and understand exactly how to fix some of the things that could go wrong during the print process. But nonetheless, I like where we're at here. We've got color, we've got good exposure, we've got a nice composition, things are in focus, and we're all set. So you've made your final print, you're ready to go. What you can do now is squeegee this to make sure it dries appropriately. You can hang it, and then once it's dried, you wanna make sure you store it properly. Of course, you know if you're gonna frame it, go ahead and do that. Get a nice frame with some good glass, and just put it somewhere where it's not gonna be in direct sunlight. Sunlight is kind of the enemy of archival prints, no matter how good the archival print is. If you're not gonna hang it up or frame it, then you can actually put this in a nice light tight box. You know, generally, if you're not gonna you know, have it out, you might as well store it and store it in complete darkness, somewhere that's relatively cool and dry. And that'll make sure that this lasts as long as it possibly can last because anything other than that, you might start to see colors degrade a bit faster and the paper itself might be hurt a little bit. So, you know, those are some really good best practices in order to keep your prints nice and healthy over time. But if you can frame it, definitely frame it because that's how you're gonna get to enjoy your print as much as possible. All right, go on to the next video to learn how to troubleshoot your prints in case you're getting some issues that you don't know how to fix.